Hey all, I'm gonna do something a little different than I normally do today. It's been precisely about five minutes since I ended the stream for the 6.4 live letter, and I thought I would do a trailer analysis of the 6.4 trailer. So, with that said, let's get right on into it. I'm just gonna cover it bit by bit and break down what we see. So we start out with Golbez looking up at the 13th while standing on what is effectively the Mare Lamentorum of the 13th, asking for an unknown someone to, in his words, I would bid you join. Fight with me for the salvation of all our souls. Who that is is unclear, but he could be talking to the Scions, interceding them to actually join him in his quest to free all of the 13th and the souls of the Void Sent there from this purgation, from this hell that they're stuck in eternally, unable to die, only able to be consumed due to the sins of the past. Then we hear the lines. Now feast, feast upon this dragon and its ardent longing for home with it. Which, who he's commanding is also unclear, but the dragon yearning for home is most likely as Daya. But what's interesting is that he's begging something or someone to feast upon it in order to empower them, using as Daya's longing and power in order to achieve some goal. What's weird is we see Vritra and his die in this scene, but we don't really see Vritra's eye, which is kind of interesting that it's missing. It's possible, though, that it's just currently within Varshan. And as Daya herself has seen better days, with the lack of Aether now from missing one eye and probably from all that's been taken from her, making her seem like her body's falling apart. Kind of like the entities that we see in The Burn, pale and bereft of Aether. We then see a shot of the Scions running towards the Aether font, with a version of the Amaratine theme playing in the background. This island is the island of Hom. It's one of the four islands that made up the archipelago that is Charlian, though Val is now missing from the whole events of Eureka. You can even see the Charlian architecture in the background. The polar bears and the ice flows also match with how, with how far north into the northern empty the, Ar the Charlian archipelago is. The Aether font itself seems to be a vein of a large amount of Aether blasting forth from the Ethereal Sea. And why it wasn't used in and of itself for a project like the Asia Scope is kind of bewildering. There must be a reason. Maybe the sheer force of it being blasted out from the ground prevented easy dissension into the Ethereal Sea itself. Either way, it's a literal wellspring of Aether, and it's probably going to play a part in some of the later events we'll see in the trailer. Whether it's the Aether font's music or not, we see these Scions fighting a familiar shark man that we saw once upon a time in Elpis. Maybe that's where the music comes from? Or maybe it's something else altogether. We then get the lines from Zero. They claim to be soldiers of a kingdom called Baron, and were traveling the realm in search of a means to end the Contra Memoria. And the most important part is that we see an echo vision, or at least some form of memory, of soldiers of Baron. We notably have a rather large figure with a black cape, blonde hair, and a giant sword. And there's a solid chance that this is Golbez during the Contra Memoria. When we look at Final Fantasy IV, Golbez himself took over the Red Wings in Baron during the events of that from Cecil. The other interesting thing is not only is the sheer size and, and strength of this individual, but it would be fitting if he was Theodore and his smaller younger brother himself was Cecil. What's interesting about the Cecil's character, despite having black hair while Cecil typically having white, he has a caduceus on his chest, which, look, maybe nothing, maybe complete random speculation, but is a symbol that has been associated with Hermes. So perhaps a Sundered Shard? It's not always useful to assume that everyone's a Sundered Shard of everyone important, and it makes the world feel smaller. But, hey, maybe there's something there. The other important thing about this potential Golbez scene is that it's much like the other scenes that we got with the Four Fiends, seeing recollections of their pasts. It would make sense to capstone that whole experience with Golbez's history. And between Baron, Troya, A Certain Red Moon, and, and any other number of Final Fantasy IV references, it's a, not exactly a template, but important to look at what they're hearkening back to. More shots of the Aether font and all the wonderful life like trolls and Apokalu that live there, although these ones look particularly penguin-like. And Thankery comes on in with the lines, Everything seems to be proceeding apace. I dare say he would have been fine without me. Which I don't know about you, but does not have me hopeful for his future, if it includes living. 
Alternatively, if, as we're seeing later, we're actually going to finally at last, as we've been predicting for a long, long time, have ac ready access between the Source and the 13th, and from there, being able to have access to the other reflections, as we know the 1st and the 13th can be connected from the role quests, maybe there's a way for him to permanently retire by going and living with his foster daughter over on the 1st, or her coming to the Source. Then we get a lovely shot of Mount Rokon, which I have emphatically been assuming is Hingashi, as the architectural stylings, not only interiorly, but with the roofing, is specific to Hingashi, as opposed to the um, Doman architecture, which is a little bit more Chinese. The other interesting thing is that in the live letter, some of the enemies had Shishu affixed to their names, which is the smaller island of Hingashi. There's Shishu and Koshu. And since Hancock is also our handler for this variant dungeon, it's pretty much emphatically clear that this is definitely going to be a Hingen Criterion dungeon, which is interesting because we also have ocean fishing in that area of the world as well. Makes you wonder if that's in any way going to be relevant to 7.0, or if they're just trying to build up that edge of the world because they don't necessarily know where else to fit it into the MSQ. Either way, it's gorgeous. And things start to take a turn for the dark. Uriyanje comes in with the line, Containment Seed? Containment Seat? I can't make it out for sure, maybe you can, but I think the overall point is very clear when he says, Containment Seed? Then thou wouldst make use of... Which I think is almost certainly pertaining to Zodiac, or the Aether remaining within Mari Lamentorum, or perhaps, even more importantly, or as part of, the barrier system that was used to contain Zodiac himself. There's going to be a relevant shot later. It would make sense that using the elemental pylons would allow for a massive amount of Aether to be able to sustain and maintain in a fixed and trapped state. If you wanted to open up a major stable portal and keep it contained, well, there are worse ways. But that's not the worrying thing. Zero looking terrifying and being absorbed by darkness when faced with Loperitz, that is a sight that I don't want to see. Now look, 14 has a past of having moments like these actually be comedic beats. So for instance, a Loperitz accidentally pissed off Zero and now Zero's about to like have a very funny moment with Loperitz. Alternatively, many, many people have been worried about Zero betraying us from the start. Now that's partly because Zero and Zero miss and cribbing from Final Fantasy IV and its story. Now, one way that could be psyched out is not having to betray us or, you know, potentially being more of a sleeper agent style character, not necessarily knowing that they intend to. Their choices up to this point, if they do betray us, seem kind of weird as they've put themselves in risky positions and had ideals that didn't necessarily match up with that. But if they weren't fully aware of their position, or if their newfound dedication to not only being selfish, but for the betterment of others, led them to decide to join Golbez in attempting to save the 13th, even at the cost of our world, well, this doesn't bode well. We get a shot of some changes to one of the frontline battle zones and more Mount Roncom, plus some island fishing and island sanctuary. The person speaking undoubtedly is a void scent of some kind, not only from the distortion, but the only people who refer to the source as the promised land and the well of boundless ether would be a void scent. Now, that kind of dialogue would insinuate that they found a way into the source, which if following our intent to open a gate, and Golbez's intent to create a way out of the 13th into the source, well, all evidence so far is pointing towards at least a few void scent being allowed to incur into our world. Now, one of the things you may say to yourself is, well, wait, Elio, we have Void Scent in our world all the time. It's not that big a deal. One of the problems is that a lot of the Void Scent we face are actually grossly limited by the fact that their corporeal forms are limited by the vessels that they inhabit. So most Void Scent are actually far weaker when we face them than they necessarily should be, unless they're so on such a low part of the rung, they're already so weak, they can kind of slip in. So if a bunch of very powerful Void Scent, things like the Four Lords and things like that, were allowed to have ready access to the world, it would be far more dangerous and have far more lasting consequences. Plus, we have no idea the level to which the astral that amount of astral aether constantly bombarding the source with all of with so many void scent returning to its live stream, how that might affect things. Because remember, this is all rooted in the fact that the 13th was devastated by a flood of darkness created by the Asians. Intentionally and unintentionally, because it fully destroyed the 13th rather than rejoining it. It made the world completely astral, kind of like how the first was com almost completely umbral. That astrality effectively destroyed and obliterated the life stream, meaning that no soul of the 13th could return to the life stream. Effectively, when you die, you just go nowhere until you reform or are eaten. 
More Mount Rokkan with a Misty Forest straight out of Sekiro, and an Izumi Yokai playing a Shamisen, with the overworld music from Final Fantasy IV playing all in the background, which for old Final Fantasy IV fans is very exciting. Orange, commence your invocations. Then a command from Yustola for Urianje to commence his invocations, and the pylons around Mare are not only repaired, but are now active. Which, in theory, would create a stasis field and a sort of stable area for Aether to be able to pool and be bound. Which is really important, because we need lots of Aether to open a portal. A portal that would allow us to get to the 13th. And in the very next shot, we see us in the Timeless Expanse, in the Interdimensional Rift, that place that we go to when we go back through time in order to arrive on Elpis, or when we arrive on the first. It's effectively a wellspring of infinite possibilities all coalescing into a place between the world, the fabrics of reality, that allow you to travel through both physical time and space. The portals that have allowed us to travel by this method in the past all have been made stable. The one in the Oculus allowing us to travel to and from the Source, Elpis, and the First. This time, we're riding Vritra through it, as well as with other Scions, meaning that this portal is not only large, but generalized, allowing for multiple people to be able to travel with ease. Now, this seems to be mainly focused on traveling to the 13th, but the 13th could act as a terminal. For instance, traveling between the 1st and the 13th we know is a thing, as Void Tears can be created between the 1st and 13th, as well as the Source and 13th. Or alternatively, this portal may singularly just be able to act as a gateway to any reflection from now on. On Vritra's back, we can see the Warrior of Light, Estinian, the very top of Zero's hat, and Ustola, which is going to match some of the fighting scenes we see later. Strangely enough, not Uriange, though. We also get the line seemingly not long after her asking Uriange to use his spell. It is time to open our gate! Which... I mean, hey, we just saw them using the gate beforehand, it seems to go hand in hand. Then we've got Blue Mage and Hildebrand. The I'm not sure it's worthy of note, but it does not seem that the calculations of Hildebrand are, um, of collegiate quality, let's say. Another shot of Rookon, and what seems like a Red Oni. And then a shot of Yustola, Zero, the Warrior of Light, Stimian, I've been waiting for this. on the Red Moon. One important thing is that so far, those portals that have been used to travel across the interdimensional rift have matched in space where they were with the flexion. Or at least the one from the first to the source. Can't really be sure about Elpis. But one exit travels to and exits from roughly the general space of the Crystal Tower. Whether that's a fundamental requirement of those portals is ambiguous, but seeing as the reflections in Source match, for the most part, in geographic space, and it seems like our characters end up on the Red Moon while traveling from Mari Lamentorum, it seems that that general principle holds. We get all of that confirmed with the Stola's line. And a great old shot of the 13th itself. And then we get Pandemonium. At the end of Abyssos, it had somehow arrived in the source, with a female voice saying, which almost sounds like zero, which does not inspire confidence. Chains shoot up from the ground with the pathway we walk along during the Asiascope dungeon below. Pandemonium breaks apart with yellow pustules breaking out from beneath it, and we see those same yellow pustules later on. We see the first boss, Cocutus, which in the Inferno is the frozen lake of hell. It's also one of the Grecian rivers of the underworld. So, if you think about how we're in the live stream, right, we are in the literal river of the underworld and underworld itself for the source. Whether it's a literal manifestation of that source or an entity like a soul like Athena or something else, I couldn't say. But what is interesting is that during the little bit that we got from the live letter, the voiced elements that we got for Cocutus did seem to be female. Now, I don't know if it was necessarily confirmed, but the fact that they chose to show us this makes me think that this is the P9. And the fact that P10 through 12 had to be avoided, according to Yoshi P, means that I think that they are quite heavy narrative spoilers. Though I have a suspicion that P10 or 11 actually is revealed in this trailer, and I'll explain in a little bit here. First, we get the lines... One of them got what they deserved. Trusting fools. Like you would be heroes. It always ends the same way. A knife in the back. Who is it and who are they referring to? Well, let's think about it. 
Yeah, I guess someone on the source could have said something like that to the Scions because we messed up. But what was more likely is that, think about the Memoriates, right? Think about the Contra Memoria. The, there were heroes. There were Warriors of Light on the 13th, but they weren't strong enough and they didn't work together enough. And they just weren't powerful enough. It would make far more sense if this was someone talking to, let's say, Golbez or some other Warrior of Light during that period of time. That sort of disillusion certainty that all there ever will be is pain, dissatisfaction, and failure, and being stabbed in the back, kind of goes along with the world that we come to understand that existed during the Contra Memoria. Though playing that over a shot of Eulis chusting Zero is, um, well, I can't tell if they're just messing with us in order to try and fake us out with the Zero Betrayal, or if they're just pulling on our heartstrings with that. After all Eulis has been in, him choosing to trust and to believe in a better world and trying to teach that to Zero, only for it to go wrong, would be heartbreaking. Fascinatingly, we get a shot of us on the Asioscope with Themis, which is odd on a number of levels. One of which is that, well, Elidibus, being there at all means that he would have had to travel either within Pandemonium or somehow through time to arrive here, which would be odd, one, because the portal we use ne shouldn't have necessarily been accessible. Maybe it is. Um, alternatively, he could have arrived putting his soul within a Convocation Crystal or something like that. But him being our size seems rather odd, relatively speaking, as the beings of Elpis should be quite a bit larger than we would be naturally. However, any number of justifications could be made to explain that away. Or perhaps this is only projection, or perhaps it has to do with the same fact that Pandemonium itself does not necessarily seem like it's scaled 3x compared to what it was like beneath Elpis. Either way, I just know I'm glad to have our friend here, even if it might be the last time we see him. And then we see La Habrea outside the gates of Pandemonium proper, back in Elpis. He still missed half his mask from when he tore off half of it, in order to not be overtaken by Athena's dark ambitions. That half being sealed within a crystal that then became Hephaestus. Importantly, that other half is actually part of the logo of 6.4. That other half being on top of what looks like a materia, crystal, or a site, something of that kind, is gonna be hyper-relevant, no question. More Anabasios, P9. The ethereal sea theme mixed with ice, goes along with Cocutus' whole thing about being, well, a frozen hell. I still couldn't tell you exactly what those trees were, and whether or not Cocutus has actually fought within Pandemonium or within the general ethereal sea itself. You can tell, however, that the background is the same ethereal background you see when doing something like character creation. Those trees may be a byproduct of its influence, or this may just be a part of the ethereal sea that up to this point we haven't necessarily witnessed, as the Asioscope itself is only a very limited section of the area. Then we get our good boy Ulyss with a wonderful little speech. Even now, I struggle with fear and uncertainty. Day after day, I ask myself, what is right? Where do we go from here? Explaining not only how he's come so far, but also the hard path that it will be for the Garleans to move forward. To not necessarily forget all of themselves, but also figure out what the right thing to do is. He also seems to be talking to a Garlean that I don't think we've seen before up to this point, with a rather specific earring, which <laughs> I couldn't tell you why, but it makes me think of the New World, or also uh, reminds me of some of the Corvosi items. We know that the 10th Legion, I believe, was in Corvos, and that they were returning to the capital, so it makes sense that he would engage with that Legatus at some point, and also Corvos may or may not have a somewhat relevant part to play in the, in the next expansion. If you're curious about some of that theorizing, click the button up above. We get a fun shot of more duty support. Not much to say there other than it's cool that this exists. And then we get the twins in Garlemald pressing a button. What does it do? Well, it seems to fire the Tower of Babel, just like Van Daniel did when he used Anima to absorb Aether throughout the world and fired at Zodiac's seal. The color this time though is a rather lovely blue, kind of like the color of the Aether font. And in this case, you have to wonder why they would want to break a seal that was already broken unless they were trying to break the seal that we made to prevent us from coming back or stop the portal. Mm, that seems a little off too. What might make more sense though is if they needed the requisite Aether in order to create the gate in the first place. And so that the Aether font or any number of other places had their Aether drawn on in order to help create a permanent gate on Mari Lamentorum to the 13th. Another shot of Cocutus, who's now a little bit more bestial. And then the next shot is far more interesting. A giant, building, angelic, nightmare monstrosity. 
We don't know what its name is, but you can see the same pustules that we did with Pandemonium before, and many of the same spires of Pandemonium, although now some with more golden accents. A lot of Amaratine-style architecture in the background. And with more than four people on the arena, and what seems like somewhat interesting mechanics, I think this is our P10 or P11. Now, why we're fighting a physical embodiment of Pandemonium is... I... Uh, uh, I don't know! But I'm super interested to find out. We get a shot of Estinian fighting Void Scent Amari Lamentorum, which really shouldn't come as much of a surprise to anyone, seeing as it's the 13th. There's gonna be Void Scent. But it's at this moment I also remember something. We saw Vritra engaging with Ajdaya earlier on in the trailer, and I made a comment about Varshan, but up to this point, we haven't seen Varshan travel into the Void. So, was that missing eye either just Vritra with closed eyes, or maybe poor lighting? Or did he leave an eye behind maybe as a means of communication on the source? Almost the very last frame of the fight with Estinian is another Void Scent teleporting in, which means that they aren't just here, they're actually being teleported from the 13th proper. We then have Golbez sitting at the precipice, where we know his throne sat before, and where Zodiark was found on the source. Presumably also where the Shard of Zodiark was found on the 13th, though we don't know exactly what happened to it. Did Golbez use it for one of his plans? Is it still there? Does he need its Aether to activate part of his plans? Well, some of this would seem like, yeah, he does. And then he says, You will go no further. And then we see Zero, and the Dark Aether at the heart of the 13th moon begin to stir. Maybe this all has to do with his Dark Throne, since it is the title of 6.4. And in Japanese, it's something to the effect of the Throne of the Sinner. Who's the Sinner? Well, maybe Golbez. We know that his sins are part of what led to the fall during the Contra Memoria. So now we get a shot of the Voidcast Deus, where we can see Golbez with a eerily familiar greatsword that we saw earlier on with a certain blonde-haired individual, and a shadow dragon twirling about him, sadly with the head of Ezdaya. It seems to be almost the exact same model, although maybe it's some alteration? With a very- uh, the body at least is greatly different. We get a twirling shot of Golbez infusing Aether into what looks to be the Shadow Dragon from before. Though it's possible that this event actually takes place before the Voidcast Aeus, rather than after. And a shot of Vritra in shock and pain, which, again, I don't think bodes necessarily that well for his Daya. The Scions running towards Golbez, he seems to proffer one final push of Aether, and then we see two brilliant red eyes coming from a Shroud of Darkness. We get the Shadow Dragon wrapping itself around his Golbez's greatsword for what seems to be some kind of transition, as you can see all the players are actually trapped in a mid-animation golden circle. And the voice lines we get from Golbez are... At last. The moment is at hand. Come, face. the wheel and brought salvation to the world. The wheel would probably be referring to the order of things on the 13th and brought salvation to the world. Well, brought salvation to his world, but who knows what it brings to ours because the only way the 13th would have been saved is if there was a way to get the denizens of the 13th off of it. We're in for a hell of a patch and a hell of a future. 6.5, gonna be wild. 7.0, gonna be wild. And I am looking forward to seeing that with you guys. Yeah, but that's about all I gleaned. I'm sure there are tons of other little bits that plenty of other people will catch on to or see in the coming days. But with only two weeks left, I thought I'd rather get this out rather sooner rather than later. Do you have any of your own thoughts? Notice anything that I didn't. Feel free to comment it down below. Hope you enjoyed, and hope to see you around in Eorzea. See you around, Archons, and stay safe.